So Act 1, Scene 2. The corpse of King Henry the sixth is carried on a bier, followed by Lady Anne dressed in mourning clothes and armed guards. A bier is a framework for carrying or displaying a corpse or coffin. So it starts off, King Henry is carried in on a bier. And uh, followed by his wife, Lady Anne, dressed in mourning clothes and armed guards. So Anne, she's speaking, Anne, set down your honorable load, men, if there is ever any honor in being dead. I want to mourn the cruel death of this good man. Look at the noble king's poor cold body, the measly, the measly remains of the Lancaster family. They put down the buyer. She's still speaking. His royal blood has drained right out of him. I hope I can talk to your ghost, Henry, without breaking church laws. I want you to hear my sorrow. My husband was murdered by the same man who stabbed you. My tears now fall into the holes where your life leaked out. I curse the man who made these holes. I curse the man's heart who had the heart to stab you. And I curse the man's blood who shed your blood. I want the man who made me suffer by killing you to face a more terrible end than I could wish on spiders, toads, and all the poisonous, venomous things, things alive. All the poisonous, venomous things, things alive. If he ever has a child, let it be born prematurely and let it look like a monster so ugly and unnatural that the sight of it frightens its own mother. It says Anne's husband was Prince Edward, King Henry's son, and, and a Lancaster. <clears throat> and she's still speaking. And if he ever has a wife, let her be more miserable when he dies than I am now. Guards, let's continue on to Ch let's continue on to Chertsey Monastery, carrying this holy burden you picked up at Saint Paul's Monastery. They pick up the buyer. She's still speaking. And when it gets too heavy, rest, and I'll lament over King Henry's corpse some more. Richard enters. Richard, halt, corpse bearers, and put down your load. And what wicked magician has conjured up this devil to interrupt this sacred burial rite? Richard, villains, set the corp sit down the corpse or I'll make a corpse of you. So Richard says, Richard calls him, villains, sit down the corpse or I'll make a corpse of you. Gentlemen, <clears throat> I guess gentlemen, I guess it's a gentleman. Uh, my lord, stand back and let the coffin pass. Richard, rude dog. Stop when I command you to, and put up your weapon so it's not pointing at my chest, or I'll strike you to the ground and trample on you, you beggar, for being so bold. They put down the buyer. And to the gentlemen and guards, what? Are you trembling? You're all afraid of him? Well, I can't blame you. You're only human after all, and mortals can't stand to look at the devil. To Richard. Be gone, you dreadful servant of hell. You only had power over my father-in-law's body. You can't have his soul, so get out. Richard, sweet saint, for goodness sake, don't be so angry. And, ugly devil, for God's sake, get out of here and leave us alone. You have made the happy world into your hell, filling it with cursing cries and lamentations. If you enjoy looking at your awful deeds, take a look at this noteworthy example of your butcheries. She points to the corpse. Oh, gentlemen, look, look, dead Henry's wounds have opened up and are bleeding again. Shame on you, you deformed lump. It's your presence that draws out this blood from his empty veins. Your inhuman and unnatural actions have provoked this unnatural flood of blood. Oh, God, who made this blood revenge his death? Oh, God, who made this blood revenge his death? Oh, earth, which soaks up this blood revenge his death. Either let heaven send lightning to strike the murderer dead or let the earth open wide and devour him as it does this good king's blood. Richard, dear woman, you don't know the rules of charity. When faced with bad, you're supposed to turn it into good. And when subject to curses, you're supposed to convert them into blessings. And villain, you don't know the laws of God or of man. Even the fiercest wild animal has some touch of pity. Richard, if I know nothing about pity, that must mean I'm not an animal. And it's amazing to hear a devil speak the truth. 
Richard, it's even stranger when an angel was so angry, divine, perfect woman. Give me a chance to prove in detail that I'm innocent of the evils you accuse me of. And contagious infection of humanity, give me a chance to condemn you for the evils I know you've committed. Richard, you who are beautiful beyond words, calm down and let me explain myself. And you who are wicked beyond belief, the only explanation I'll accept from you is for you to, is for you to hang yourself. Richard, such an expression of despair would only provoke that I was guilty. Richard, such an expression of despair would only prove that I was guilty. And, maybe, but if you killed yourself, it would also show that you felt some guilt for killing others. Richard, let's say I didn't kill him. And, then you might as well say they're not dead, but they are dead and you killed them, you slave of the devil. You slave, of, you slave of the devil. Richard, I did not kill your husband. And, well, then he must be alive. Richard, no, he is dead. Edward killed him. And, you're lying. Queen Margaret saw your sword steaming with his blood. It was the same sword you almost killed her with, and you would have killed her if my brothers hadn't fought you off. Richard, she provoked me with her lying mouth, accusing me of crimes I didn't commit. And, no... What provoked you was your own bloody mind, which never thinks about anything but butchering. You killed this king, didn't you? Richard, yes, I'll grant you that. And you'll grant me, you hedgehog. Then let God grant me that you'll be damned for... for um, <laughs> let me read it again. And you'll grant me, you hedgehog. Then let God grant me that you'll be damned for the wicked deed. Oh, he was gentle, mild, and virtuous. Richard, that will please, Richard, um, Richard says this, that will please God who has him now, and he is in heaven, but you will never go, Richard, let him thank me who helped him get there, he's better suited to be there than here, so the aunt says, and you're not suited for any place except hell, Richard, yes, and one other place, if you only let me name it, and some dungeon, Richard, your bedroom, and there was no rest to be had in any bedroom where you are, Richard, exactly, madame, until I sleep with you, and I hope you're right, Richard, I know I am, but gentle lady Anne, let's stop this rapid fire argument and move more slowly, isn't the person who caused the untimely deaths of these two plantagenets? Henry and Edward, as much to blame as the person who actually executed the murders. So what? what? So he says, I know I am, because she says, I hope you're right. There was no rest to be had in any bedroom where you are, Richard, Richard said, exactly, madame, until I sleep with you. And she says, I hope you're right. Anne assumes that she's never going to sleep with him. I hope you're right. Meaning like that there's no rest. There's no rest in any bedroom. Exactly, madame, until I sleep with you. So when she says, I hope you're right, she's saying it like, you're never going to sleep with me, so you'll never get rest, really. And he says, I know I am, but gentle lady Anne, let's stop this rapid fire argument and move more slowly. Isn't the person who caused the untimely deaths of these two plantagenets? So he's saying Henry and Edward are the ones that they caused it. So aren't they as much to blame as the person who actually executed the murders? So they're saying, what's a plantagenet? A plantagenet was the name of the royal family that ruled England from the 12th to the 15th centuries. Both the Lancasters, the family to which Lady Anne's husband and father-in-law belonged, and the Yorks, the family to which Richard and his brothers belong, are descended from the plantagenets, P-L-A-N-T-A-G-E-N-E-T-S. So back to what Richard was saying. So Anne responds, you're both those people responsible for both cause and effect. Richard, your beauty caused what I did. It haunted me in my sleep. I would have killed the whole world just to be able to spend one hour next to you. And if I believed you murderer, I would take my nails and scratch that beauty right off my cheeks. Richard, I couldn't stand to see you destroy your beauty. You won't touch it as long as I'm standing next to you. Just as everyone becomes cheerful from the sun, I'm cheered up by your looks. They are my they are my daylight, my life. And then I hope night shadows your day and death takes your life. 
Richard, don't damn yourself, you fair lady, are both my day and my life, and I wish I were so I could deprive you of both day and life, Richard. It's strange that you want to take revenge on the person who loves you, and it's just, and it's just and reasonable that I want to take revenge on the person who killed my husband, Richard. The man who killed your husband, dear lady, only did it to help you get a better husband. <laughs> it's kind of comedy, and there was no better one on earth. Richard, wrong. There was a man who loves you better than your husband could, and name him, Richard, Plantagenet, and yes, that's my husband's name, Richard. Someone else has that same name, but he's a better man, and where is this man, Richard, here, and spits at him. Why do you spit at me, and if only I could spit poison, Richard. Poison never came from such a sweet place, and... Poison never landed on such an ugly toad. Get out of my sight. You're poisoning my eyes. Richard, your beautiful eyes, sweet lady, have infected mine with love. And I wish my eyes were basilics so they could strike you dead. So basilics were mythical creatures whose glances killed the people they landed on. Basilics. B-A-S-I-L-I-S-K-S. Basilics? Basilisks? Yeah, so I guess there were mystical creatures that whatever they looked at, they destroyed them. They killed the people that they they looked at. So Richard, I wish they were so that I could die right now because at this point, I live a living death. Your eyes have made me cry shamefully like a child. I never cried before this. I didn't cry when my father, York, and my brother Edward both wept at the death of my brother Rutland, whom Clifford slaughtered. And when your warrior father recounted the sad story of my father's death, pausing to sob twenty times in the course of the story so that all the by bystanders ended up dripping tears like trees in a rainstorm, even then I refused to cry. But your beauty has made me cry until I couldn't see. I never tried to win over a friend or an enemy with sweet words. I'm too proud for that. But if your beauty is a reward for sweet talk, I'll talk. Anne looks at him with disgust. Don't curl your lips in scorn. They were made for kissing, not for contempt. If your vengeful heart can't forgive me, here, take my sword and bury it in my heart so that my soul, which adores you, can be free. I open myself to being stabbed. In fact, I beg for death on my knees. He opens his shirt to expose his chest, and she points the sword toward it. No, don't pause, because I did kill King Henry. Though it was your beauty that made me do it, go ahead, and it was me who stabbed young Edward. Though it was your heavenly face that set me to work. Anne lets the sword drop. Take up the sword again or take me up. Anne, get up, liar. Though I wish you were dead, I'm not going to be the one to kill you. Richard, rising, then tell me to kill myself and I will. Anne, I have already. Richard, you said it when you were furious. Say it again. Just one word in my hand which killed your lover out of love will kill your, f will kill your far truer lover. You will be an you will be an accessory to both crimes. And I wish I knew what was in your heart. Richard, I've told you, and I fear that your words in your heart are both false, Richard, that no man has ever been honest. And well then, put your sword away, Richard. Tell me that you'll accept my love. And you'll know about that later. I feel like she's breaking, dude, that's crazy. Richard, but can I have some hope? And I like to think all men have some hope. Richard, please wear this ring. And I'll take the ring, but don't assume I'm giving you anything in return. He places the ring on her finger. Richard, see how my ring encircles your finger? That's how your heart embraces my poor heart. Where both the ring and my heart, because both are yours. Or says, wear both the ring and my heart, because both are yours. And if I, your poor devoted servant, may ask you for one small favor, you will guarantee my happiness forever. And what's that? Richard, please leave it to me to take care of the burial as I have more reason to mourn than you do. Meanwhile, go to my estate at Crosby Place. After I have performed the solemn burial rites for this noble king at Chertsey Monastery and cried with regret at his grave, I'll hurry to meet you. For various reasons that must remain secret, please do this for me. And I'll do it with all my heart. I'm happy to see you've come to repent for what you've done. Trestle and Berkeley, come with me. Richard, say goodbye to me. And 
It's more than you deserve, but since you're already teaching me how to flatter you, pretend I say goodbye already. Anne and two others exit. Richard. Sirs, take up the corpse. Gentlemen, toward Chertsey, noble lord. Richard. No, to the White Friars Monastery. Wait for me there. Everyone exits except Richard. Has anyone ever courted a woman in this state of mind? And has anyone ever won her as I've done? I'll get her, but I won't keep her long. What? I who killed her husband and his father managed to win her over when her hatred for me was strongest? While she's swearing her head off, sobbing her eyes out, and the bloody corpse proof of why she should hate me right in front of her? She has God, her conscience, and my own acts against me, and I have nothing on my side but the ugly devil and my false looks. And yet against all odds, I win her over. Ha! Has she already forgotten her brave husband, Prince Edward, whom I stabbed on the battlefield three months ago in my anger? The world will never again produce such a sweet, lovely gentleman. He was graced with lots of natural gifts. He was young, valiant, wise, and no doubt meant to be king. And yet she cheapens herself by turning her gaze on me. Who cut her sweet prince's life short and made her a widow? On me, though I am barely half the man that Edward was. On me, though I am limping and deformed. I bet I've been wrong about myself all this time. Even though I don't see it, this lady thinks I'm a marvelously good-looking man. Time to buy myself a mirror and employ a few dozen tailors to dress me up in the current fashions. Since I'm suddenly all the rage, it will be worth the cost. But first, I'll dump this fellow in his grave, then return to my love weeping with grief. Come out, beautiful sun, until I've bought a mirror to admire my reflection in. I'll watch my shadow as I stroll along. I'll dump this fellow in his grave. <laughs> he exits. <laughs> this is pretty comical, man. I'm not even going to lie. <clears throat> but I was going to say, I, it's, like Shakespeare is smart, because he, he's thinking the reader's going to be like, all of a sudden she was hating him, and now she's like has fallen for him. And he's even saying, like, she's a trick. Like, I can't love her long. Look at how she easily forgets her husband, who's twice the man I'll ever be. Virtuous and honest and valiant, courageous, brave. And I think he's being sarcastic. Well, I'll, I'll get a mirror, you know, and I'll have to look at myself. And I'll have to get, you know, servants to dress me up in all the high fashion because I'm, I'm all of a sudden this beautiful person now. You know, the one that killed her husband and blah, blah, blah. So, I don't know. He's, I feel like um, this little misogyny, they would call the misogyny, he's kind of being sarcastic to the idea of women on to the next, you know. <laughs> Good night, y'all. That's, that's enough.